It's good to have you with us. We are currently in uh, the book of Acts, and um, we'll definitely have to speed this up when we get to India. Uh, we're in chapter 9, and uh, this is one of the great sections, I think, in the book of Acts where we see Saul of Tarsus uh, come into saving faith in Jesus Christ. You know, there are certain people that, you know, we just don't expect to get saved. You know, there's people you could probably think of, family members, maybe friends, and you're like, eh, I don't see that person ever getting saved. You know, they don't like Jesus at all. They don't like Christians. They hate the Bible. And, you know, then God surprises us, and through His grace, His love, His mercy, His, uh, you know, He breaks through, and the Holy Spirit brings us to that place where we are confronted with our sin and we see Jesus as the Savior and then we have a decision to make. Are we going to receive Him or are we going to reject Him? You know, I never get tired of seeing people come to Christ and they uh, are set free from their sins. They're new creations in Christ. And um, people, especially in America, say, oh, don't why don't we see so many miracles? Well, I see miracles every day when we p see people give their life to Jesus because that's the greatest miracle of all. You go from death to life. You go from darkness to light you go from uh, hanging over the pit of you know the lake of fire to being brought into paradise to be with jesus for eternity and so you know that's something that is ongoing um it's really nothing short of a miracle as god reaches out and touches uh, people's lives and saves their souls and perhaps one of the greatest conversions of all time was saul of tarsus you know, if you're to take a poll of, you know, followers of Jesus back at this time, you know, who's the least likely person to get saved? I'm sure 99% of the believers in Jesus would say Saul of Tarsus. He hates us. He's trying to destroy us. He hates Jesus. And so, you know, he just wants to destroy the church. And so Paul himself, he wrote many years later that after his conversion, and he had known the Lord for about 30 years. He writes this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And then Paul goes on to explain that, you know, if God could save somebody like me, he can save anybody. And that's really what he understood. He really believed that. His conversion would be a powerful, awesome testimony of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness, His love. And again, if there's someone in your life that you can think of that is so far gone and you think, man, I don't see how they're ever going to come to Christ, don't give up on that person. Keep praying for them. You know, that's what people did with me. They, I, I've admitted that I heard the gospel probably 25 times, and the first 25 times I heard the gospel very clearly, uh, I'd either try to punch the guy out or I'd scream and yell at him and cuss him out and they'd leave and nobody ever thought I was going to get saved. And yet God has a way of breaking us and getting us to the end of ourselves. And we'll see that here with Paul here, Saul of Tarsus in a moment. But never forget that person you think is so far gone, uh, Jesus loves him. You know, his blood is sufficient to cleanse them of all sin. Uh, he's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. Now, this chapter marks one of the greatest days in the history of the church. Uh, truly a pivotal moment, as far as the New Testament believers are concerned. Uh, his conversion is recorded three times in the book of Acts. Uh, here in chapter 9, also in chapter 22, uh, we'll see him standing before the, the Jewish people there on the Temple Mount, he gets kicked out of the temple and he gives a, you know, his testimony there. And he talks about how Jesus has done this amazing work and he's going to send him to the Gentiles. As soon as he says the word Gentiles, they want to kill him. And so he gets arrested. He ends up going before King Agrippa there in Caesarea in chapter 26. He will preach the gospel, give his testimony once again. And, and so he was all about sharing his testimony, how he was lost, but he's found. He was in darkness, now he's in light. He was on death's door, but now he has everlasting life. Um, he also mentions this in a number of places in his writings. Um, his conversion, though, was so radical. He was like a wild beast trying to destroy anybody that put their life in the hands of Jesus and trusting the, the Lord. And uh, he goes from being a destroyer of the church to being its greatest defender. 
to being the one who would travel anywhere, go anywhere to uh, share the love of Christ, the forgiveness and the hope that is in Jesus. And, and a change like that can only happen to those who've had a genuine encounter with the risen Lord and Savior. He wasn't just a concept in his brain. Jesus met him. Jesus had an encounter with Paul. Paul had a, an encounter with the risen Savior. And, and Saul of Tarsus very uniquely raised. Um, you can see how God put all this together, and, and Paul realizes that later, that, wow, he separated me from my mother's womb to have this ministry to tell people about Jesus, even though for most of his, well, for 30 plus years maybe of his life, he was antagonistic towards the church. Uh, here's a few verses. Look at these on the screen in um, chapter 22 of Acts, verse 3. It says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, speaking of Jerusalem, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. And so, again, uniquely raised as a Jew, uh, probably when he's 13, he goes down to Jerusalem. He will become the number one student for the number one rabbi at the time, Gamaliel, and he'll be at his feet for a number of years and he will be trained by him. And, and so again, he knew the, the Old Testament inside and out, even though he didn't truly understand it. He, he knew it, uh, highly educated. He was also a Roman citizen. And we'll see even in Acts how God will use his citizenship to open up doors, you know, and give him opportunities that many Jews did not have. But because of that Roman citizenship, he was able to exercise some of the, the laws. He was able to use some of those laws to his benefit. Um, this is why I want to encourage all of you as American citizens to use your vote wisely. Um, God is going to hold us accountable for what we do with who we vote for. So we need to exercise that vote. Philippians chapter 3. I love this section because here's part of Paul's testimony. Starting in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for to me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Uh, in other words, he's saying beware of the, the religious leaders of Judaism at the time who say you can't, well, even the Judaizers say you can't get saved unless you're circumcised. He calls them the mutilation. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, so here's his Jewish background. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day. That was the day God told, you know, the Jews, that's the day you're to be circumcised, the eighth day of the stock of Israel. In other words, I'm a direct descendant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, of the tribe of Benjamin, they were a loyal tribe. They stayed loyal to the uh, nation of Judah. Uh, the first king of Israel was from Benjamin, King Saul. He says then, um, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In other words, Paul did not mix with the Gentiles uh, like a lot of the Hellenistic Jews. They were kind of, you know, taking in some of the culture of the Greeks. But Paul's like, no, I am strictly a Jew. I've never known anything else. I'm not going to know anything else. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says then, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Again, all the other Jews will look up to the Pharisees. They're like the superstar Jews. You know, they were held in high esteem. And Paul was, you know, one of them, a Pharisee. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. And that's what we've seen so far in Acts, in Acts chapter 8 wreaking havoc of the church. He was like a wild beast destroying the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Can you imagine? He was a very highly vocal critic of Jesus, but he was also a very highly sought after rabbi because, I mean, this guy, if you looked at him from the surface, you'd think this guy is right on. He is holding fast to the law. And yet he comes to realize 
I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Nobody can keep the law. That's the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, Jesus says, if you have anger in your heart without a cause, you're guilty of murder. Uh, you've heard it said, I've never committed adultery. You know, and that's what Paul would say. I've never committed adultery, but if you had lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery in your heart. So Jesus breaks down and shows him, no, you're not keeping the law, even though he says, according to the law, blameless. Wow. Look at chapter 9, verse 1, book of Acts. Paul's background, so unique. Uh, from one extreme, he'll go to the other extreme. Then Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, maybe that was Caiaphas at that time still, and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. That's up in Syria. It's about 150 miles away from Jerusalem. So that if he found any who were of the way, uh, followers of Jesus were often referred to as the way, probably because Jesus said, I am the way, uh, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. So he's traveling with official papers in hand to Damascus. And if he finds any of these people who are of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Any of you have been up you know, on the top of the Golan Heights uh, with us in Israel, uh, you can get out on this point, and it's really cool. It's uh, We weren't able to do it last time, but the time before. And you can actually see Damascus. It's like 40 miles away. And you can see the road heading up to Damascus, probably the same road that Paul was on as he's going up there with official papers in hand to arrest those who are following this guy named Jesus. Verse 3, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now, if you were to stop Paul on the road and ask him why he was trying to destroy these people, these Jews, why are you trying to destroy your fellow Jews? He would say, Jesus is dead. He's a false Messiah. You know, the, the word says in Deuteronomy 21, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So why would God take a cursed person and make him our Messiah? That, that doesn't make any sense. So would God take a cursed, false prophet? No way. And so as these followers are concerned, they're saying Jesus is alive. They're saying they're doing these miracles by the hand of Jesus. But I think they're doing it by the hand of Satan. And so I got to destroy them before they destroy the Jewish faith. And so he looked at them as a dangerous cult of people that are corrupting the historic Jewish faith. He actually thought he was doing God a favor. And later on he would say, you know, he did all these things in ignorance and unbelief. You know, he just didn't know who Jesus Christ was. He, <clears throat> probably better than any of us, he knew the Old Testament. And he studied the Old Testament. But he didn't know Jesus. And Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. He knew the Bible, but he didn't know the God of the Bible. Um, Jesus even says to the Pharisees, and it's in John 5, 40, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. And so if you don't see Jesus in the Old Testament, then you're missing the whole point of why Jesus is the Messiah and why God has given us the Old Testament. And people today that say, oh, we don't need to study the Old Testament, it's all in the New Testament, be very careful because the Old Testament is in the New Testament. You know, the New Testament is found throughout the Old Testament. It's God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. So don't start dicing the Scriptures and saying, ah, oh, we don't need the Old Testament. It's all about, how do we even know where we came from without Genesis 1, 1, and 2? You know, how do, how do you know what sin is all about unless you know Genesis, or, yeah, Genesis chapter 3? Be that as it may, he's journeying, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, verse 4. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so just before he gets in Damascus and he's got these guys around him, they're, you know, it's like a little army going up there to arrest wayward Jews. The glory of the Lord knocks him to the ground. He hears his voice, the voice of Jesus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I think at this very moment, the prayers of all the saints were being answered. Lord, get Saul of Tarsus. 
Lord, strike him down. Lord, he's trying to kill us, so you need to take care of this guy. You know, it would be like some of us praying for uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. You know, my prayer is, God, strike him down. You know, and Jesus might be thinking, he needs to be saved. That's what they were thinking about Saul of Tarsus. He needs to be destroyed. Instead of destroying him, Jesus is going to save him. Now, notice also how Jesus relates his church, his followers. Notice how we are so attached to Jesus, he calls us the body of Christ. And, and that's what he's saying here. Why are you persecuting me? Paul's thinking, I, Saul's saying, I didn't persecute Jesus. He's dead. Who's he referring to? His believers, his followers. We are the body of Christ. In Jesus' mind, yes, you are persecuting me by persecuting my people. Now, notice the, the sovereign grace of God towards Saul here. Saul wasn't seeking Jesus. He wasn't trying to get saved. He wasn't, oh, i got to search with all my heart, and I'm going to find the truth here in Jesus. No, not even close. He's there, filled with anger, bitterness, wrath, wanting to destroy the, the church, and yet Jesus sovereignly appears to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, at this moment, he could have said, who are you? And he's going to tell him who he is. He could have just said, nah, I'm not going to follow because we all have a free will. But he's going to know instantly what's going on here. Jesus wanted to change this man who was filled with such hate, such murder, and turn him into a man after God's own heart. Again, God doesn't want to destroy. It's not his desire for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Look at verse 5. And he said, so Saul says, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. A couple of important things to notice here. First of all, to his utter amazement, he discovers Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. He's the one speaking to me. When he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. You know, he could have been saying, you're out to arrest followers of me, but guess what? What? They're right. They're telling everybody I'm alive. Well, guess what, Saul? I am alive. I'm speaking to you right now. What are you going to do about it? Then Jesus tells him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean? Well, goads have been around for thousands of years, literally, um, shepherds, um, herdsmen, you know, plowmen, they all had goads. It's a long stick with a sharp, pointy object, like a nail at the end of it. And so if your animal, you know, that's, you're plowing the field, and for no reason it just stops in the middle of the field, and you need to keep going, you know, sun's coming down, we got to keep doing this, you'd take his stick and bink, give him a little zap on the backside, and that would motivate the animal, keep going. And so they, they would get the animal going. It's amazing how that animal could be motivated with simply being goaded. Um, you might think you have a stubborn ox, and like it says here, why are you kicking against the goad? You can have a stubborn ox that is kicking against it. You're trying to goad it, and it keeps kicking back, and what is it doing? It's hurting itself. It's kicking itself against the sharp object even more. Saul, why are you doing this? You get so many people telling you, I'm alive. All these people he's been arresting. All these people he's had put to death. He's, he's trying to get them to renounce Jesus. We saw that earlier. And yet they're probably telling him, no, Jesus is alive. And he's kicking against that. You're not hurting them. You are hurting yourself. And so Jesus is telling Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, what were the goads in Saul's life? Probably one of the goads was the gospel. Just the gospel message going forth. It's spreading like wildfire. And Saul's trying to stomp it out. But like many wildfires, the harder you stomp on it on a windy day, the more it spreads. And so that's got to be just goading him. It's like, this is bugging me. I mean, I'm trying to eliminate these people. It keeps growing. The harder he tried to crush it out, the, the further it spread. Probably the biggest, sharpest goad in Saul's life was the death of Stephen. Remember at the end of chapter 7, we're told that Saul was guarding all the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen to death. 
And he's there. He's giving hearty approval to his death. He's the first martyr. And what does he hear Stephen say? He's looking up. I see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Father. And he says, Lord Jesus, don't hold this sin against them. And then he dies. And I'm sure that stuck with Saul. I mean, he, th those words are ringing through his brain and he's kicking against that. I think Stephen's death was like a time bomb just ready to blow up in his heart because he had traveled to Damascus and he's not seeing any victory here, but he's confronted by the risen, living Lord and Savior himself. Here I am, Saul, the one you've denied, the one you've rejected. What are you going to do about me? You're fighting against me, but guess what? You're never going to win. If you're fighting against the Lord today, you're never going to win. The best thing you can do is surrender to Him. Stop kicking against what you know is true. Maybe there's some people here, you're, you're, you're kicking against rejection of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've come here because you're reluctantly here because somebody's been bugging you. You need to come to church with me. Now you're here. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose from the grave. He's here to offer eternal life. And if you're a person who is fighting against that conviction, all I can say is that's dumb. You need to stop. I mean, you're not hurting Jesus. You're hurting yourself if you keep kicking against the goad. You're on a path that leads to eternal destruction. But God loves you so much, He's going to keep chasing after you. Uh, like we'll, we'll see with Saul, it's best to surrender to him. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him take control. Look at verse 6. This is exactly what Saul will do. So he trembling and astonished. I, I bet he was. The last person he ever expected to be confronted with is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus the Messiah. Here he is speaking to him. And it says he's trembling. He is astonished. And this is where I think he gets saved. Lord, because he knows Jesus is Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Again, I believe it's at this very moment Saul of Tarsus becomes born again. He becomes a new creation in Christ. He'll write about it later. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And it's that quick. It's that fast. All the struggles that Paul had with God, with Jesus, are now going to be removed. The battles in his mind are now going to be cleared up. And what he has been introduced to is Jesus Christ and the reality of the truth that he is alive. Paul has nothing else to argue about. He knows I've been 100% wrong. His followers are 100% right. I'm having a conversation with the risen Lord. What could he do but turn to Jesus? He couldn't fight against the Lord because he knew he'd be fighting against God. And that's something Saul never wanted to do. He never wanted to fight against God. He thought he was defending God. He loved God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love his neighbor as himself. Deuteronomy 6, I mean, that was part of his DNA. He thought, I love God, and I'm doing this because I love God. But now he realizes the Father and the Son are on the same team. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one. So, Lord, what do you want me to do? And in that simple act of surrender to Jesus, he is saved. His whole life will be radically changed from this day forward. And again, it happened that fast. And it can happen that fast with you. If you don't know Christ today, you can go from death row to eternal life. You can go from damnation to exaltation. You can go from the pit to paradise, but you have to surrender to the Lord. If you want your sins forgiven, you need Jesus. If you want your uh, life to be at peace with God, you need to surrender to Jesus. You have to ask Him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. And that's what Saul did. Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I don't want to stay wrong. I need you. I don't want to fight against you. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So Jesus again says, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. 
This is the way it's supposed to be. We don't tell God what to do and how to do it. We ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? This is something the church in America is getting all messed up. The church here is especially guilty of this. We think it's our right as a Christian nation to change the rules of God's word. Yeah, I know God's word says husbands love your wife, even as Christ loves the church, but I don't feel like it. It has nothing to do with your feelings. Yeah, as a wife, I know the Bible says wives love you, or be in submission to your own husband as unto the Lord, but I really don't feel like it. It's not about your feelings. Oh, I know the Bible says train up your children in the way they should go. I know the Bible says don't provoke your children to wrath, but, you know, I think Dr. So-and-so's got a better plan for raising kids. God's Word is the final authority, not Dr. So-and-so. Dr. So-and-so has screwed up a lot of kids. But we all need to realize that the farther we get away from the simple teachings of God's Word, the more turmoil we create in our own families, the more turmoil we create in churches. Because God's Word is truth. God's Word shines light. It fills us with wisdom. Uh, it gives us insight into God's heart, His mind, His plans, His purposes, His will for our lives. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 17, as He's praying there to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Uh, Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away. We know it's going to happen. We read about it in the book of Revelation. It's all going to be vaporized. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. It's all going to melt with fervent heat. The whole universe is going to pass away. But he says, my words will by no means pass away. His word is eternal. This world isn't. So grab hold of the Word of God. Don't let go of the Word of God. Jesus is still saying to us, like He says in Luke 9.23, if any of us desires to uh, come after Me, then deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Follow Me, Jesus says. So as Christians in America, we need to get back to walking by faith and not by feelings. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Jesus says those who worship the Father must worship in what? Spirit and truth, the truth of His Word, and in spirit. For a few years back, there was a big thing going around. Oh, we just want to feel God. We want to worship Him with our five senses. You know, your sight, your ears, your smell. You know, say light candles. You know, they would have, get the music just right. You got to hear it. You got to have a sandbox in the church where you'd write a secret sin and then visualize Jesus wiping it away. Your five senses are involved. No. It's by the Spirit working in you, working through you, not through your senses. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Saul heard the Word of God, literally Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and he quickly puts his faith in Him. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a good question. Ask yourself, when was the last time I... Ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? Again, so often we want to tell him what to do and how to do it. Verse 7. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Now when you put the three accounts together, these men, they heard a sound, but they didn't hear the distinction of what Jesus was saying. Um, they don't know what it is. Only Paul hears what Jesus is saying directly to him. Um, you know, I've had that happen when I've witnessed to people as well. You can have two people there in front of you and you're talking to them, sharing the gospel. And you can see like the light bulb coming on this person. And you know, the Holy Spirit's working on that guy or that gal. And then the other person is like, hello, McFly, you know, anybody home? I mean, it's just going right over and they have no concept. It's just... Bouncing right over them. So anyway, look at verse 8. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, uh, or he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And so he's temporarily blinded by this experience. Some, you know, was he blinded because of the brightness of the Lord appearing to him? 
we're not told, but we'll see in a moment, scales were on his eyes. Um, he'll spend the first three days of his life in utter, total darkness. And yet, the light of Jesus is now radiating in him. And I, I know that spiritually, Paul was seeing things more clearly than he's ever seen things before. And there are probably a couple of things going through his mind as he sat here in darkness for those three days. Um, I've talked with enough military guys that saw action to where they can remember the faces of those they killed in action, you know, and that haunts them. That's where a lot of the PTSD comes from. You know, they can, they can see that family or that person that they just shot in battle and it's horrible. I'm sure that's what's going through his mind. He's probably seeing all those men, all those women, all those kids. He had families destroyed. He had some put to death, he says. He had some in prison, some beaten. And I'm sure that's running through his mind at this time. He probably saw the faces of those who had been brutalized by him. But at the same time, I'm sure his mind is also racing through the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi and what is he thinking? Now he's seeing Jesus. All these verses that he did not see Jesus, now he's seeing Jesus. Now he's understanding who Christ is. Now, the scene shifts, and one of these simple disciples that's living in Damascus, well, we'll focus on this guy. Look at verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now, don't confuse him with chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They're, they're both dead. So this is a different Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. I, I, what a close relationship Ananias had. You know, Ananias, right here, Lord. Wow, when was the last time that happened to me? Or maybe you. I mean, do we have ears to hear him speak that clearly? Just so matter of fact. Ananias, all right here. Well, he was not an apostle. He was not a deacon. He's just a regular old guy there, Jewish believer in Jesus, living in Damascus. Just a regular disciple. Disciple, And when he heard God's word, he responds. And, and that's what God desires from us when we hear his word, and he wants us to respond. He wants us to agree with him. He wants us to agree with his word. When his word says, avoid such sins as these, what do you do? Well, the Bible tells me this, but that must be for somebody else. That's not for me. Don't have that attitude. You know, when the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you, how do you respond? Oh, that's for that other guy. I'm good. God wants us to have a close personal relationship with you. He wants us to walk close to him all the time. Are we responding to him? The number one reason people don't hear from God like maybe they used to is not because God isn't speaking. It's because we're not listening. We can only hear him as we spend time, quiet time, in the word of God. So, at 2.05, the Broncos are playing the Chargers. I don't think the Lord's going to speak very clearly to me during the game. So I encourage you, at some point, <laughs> turn off the TV, turn off the stereo, get off the computer, make it quiet, spend that quiet time with the Lord in His Word. It's so important. Ananias, here I am, Lord. Verse 11, so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight. And uh, my understanding is that street called Straight is still there in Damascus. And inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. I mean, I love how the Lord just sets this up. Ananias, go to this street. It's called Straight. Go inside. There's a guy named Saul of Tarsus there. You know, I already gave him a vision that a guy named Ananias, that would be you. You're going to go there. You're going to lay hands on him. He's going to see, you know, restore his sight. And, and so 
it's just all put together by the Lord. I mean, here's another example of God doing the extraordinary through the ordinary. God could have sent Peter or John or one of the other apostles. You know, he could have sent Philip up there, but he sends just simple, obedient disciple named Ananias. God can do. He's done great things through, you know, some of the biggies out there like Billy Graham, Chuck Smith, you know, people like Corey Ten Boom, um, Elizabeth Elliot. He can use, you know, people we all recognize, but he wants to use all of us. And any simple thing he calls us to do, we might think, well, that's a simple thing, not in God's kingdom. Anything he asks us to do is not simple. It's a blessing. It's wonderful to be able to do whatever he calls us to do. To him, there's no little thing. But the Bible also says, if you're faithful in the little things, he will bring the increase. So start off being faithful in the simple things, like spending time in his word, in prayer, in fellowship, like you are today. Verse 13 you got to love Ananias. He says, And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. You know, the Jews are very, very smart when it comes to intel. Think of all of those who have been eliminated in uh, by, you know, they've eliminated so many in uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah. And how do these, get, how do the Jews know these guys are right there in that one little building? They're gathered, boom, they're gone. And and even the president, well, even Ayatollah and then the president of Iran, they're now starting to wonder how many Jews are planted in our government. And they're starting to question some of their top officials because they think they're working for the IDF. They probably are. <laughs> But, you know, how does he know? Saul of Tarsus, how does he know? He's coming up here with official papers to arrest us. But he knows. Word spreads. But the Lord, well, first of all, you, you got to appreciate the fact that Ananias is a little bit apprehensive. Uh, you sure you got the right Saul of Tarsus, Lord? The only Saul of Tarsus I know is a terrible man. He's angry. He's vicious. He wants to kill us. He wants to destroy us. He hates you. Paul is probably going to arrest Ananias and bring him back. So yeah, you'd be a little tentative. You sure you want me to go there, Lord, to talk to this guy? Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So the Lord confirms his will for Ananias. I've got the right Saul of Tarsus. Go lay hands on him. He's no longer a savage beast, a roaring lion. I've tamed him. Now he's on our team. And notice also the Lord's calling upon Saul's life. He is going to testify of Jesus before the Jews, before the Gentiles, even before kings. And we'll see that later on in Acts where Saul's heart's desire, his prayer for Israel, is that they would be saved, Romans 10.1. So he knew he was called to the Gentiles. That was his primary ministry. But any time he went to any city, the first thing he did was look for a synagogue, look for his fellow Jews. And he would go in because he's still a rabbi. In their eyes, he's still part of the, the leadership. He had carte blanche. He can go in and teach. And so, he, and we'll see this in chapter 17 very clearly. He'd go in and he'd explain from their scriptures, Jesus is the Messiah. And then sometimes they would believe, many times he'd get run out of town. But the point is, he loved his Jewish brethren and he was praying for them. He was winning them to Christ. He was doing all that he can. His primary ministry was to the Gentiles. And we'll see him stand before kings. King Agrippa in chapter 26 uh, history says he stands before Caesar Nero, the mightiest man on earth at the time. And, and they think that after he met with Caesar Nero, gave him the gospel, Paul would be released for two years, but it was during that time that Caesar Nero goes nuts. And then he starts a fire in Rome. They blame it on the followers of Christ. They start to persecute the church heavily. But Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. Notice also... Paul had no idea what God had prepared him for. 
Now, I believe the Lord is preparing some of you to do ministry. I don't know what that looks like. It doesn't necessarily mean up here behind the pulpit, but whatever ministry he has for you, he's preparing you. And, and everything is working together for our good. You know, your background, whatever your background is, it could have been like mine, you know, totally messed up, living in sin and wickedness, rebellion, but then God can get a hold of you and he can take you a whole different direction. So your experiences, both good and bad, God has been preparing you for service to Jesus. And like Paul, he says you're a chosen vessel. You're a chosen vessel of his. And, and he says to bear his name. That means to tell others about the good news, about his grace, his love, his compassion, his truth, the hope we have in Christ. Look at verse 16. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, you know Saul's saved. He wouldn't call him a brother unless he was. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's already got the Holy Spirit in him, but now he wants him filled up, overflowing with the Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So, first of all, notice in verse 16 when Jesus tells Ananias, I'm going to show him all that he is going to suffer for my name's sake. Many things. I don't know about you, but I would have a hard time handling it if the moment I got saved, the Lord showed me everything I was going to go through in ministry. I'd be like, you got a plan B, Lord? You know, it's been hard sometimes on my wife. It's been hard on our kids. You know, we've had people attack for different reasons. And, you know, it, it would have been difficult. And so you just go step by step, day by day. God has been very gracious to us, very patient. Uh, he's very faithful. And the good news is he's not finished with any of us yet. Now he tells him, you're going to tell him all that he's going to endure. What did Paul have to endure? Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You can do it on your own. But that's where he talks about, you know, the beatings he took, the stoning he went through, the imprisonments. Um, by the way, never book a cruise with Paul. He had three shipwrecks, so that's not a good, good thing to be on a boat with Paul. I mean, he went through a lot, just a heavy-duty persecution, just the, the love he had for the saints. He even had saints attacking him at times, and yet he was so focused on Jesus. He knew that no matter what happens to me, Jesus is worth it because I'm gone, I've gone from death row to eternal life. Jesus is worth it. All the heartaches, all the hassles, all the pain and suffering. He will say, that's like light affliction in, compared to the glory of being with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, again, verse 17, Ananias obeys. He goes there. He says, Brother Saul. Awesome. That must have filled Saul with such joy in his heart. I'm his brother. I came here to destroy guys like him, but now I'm his brother. What an amazing thing. New creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Everything's become new. It says, as Ananias laid his hands on Saul and prayed for him, something like scales fell from his eyes. Again, we don't know exactly what that means. Maybe, you know, like, like almost like blisters. I mean, I don't know, sunburned eyes, but all of a sudden he's healed and he can see. And the first thing he sees is his brother Ananias standing over him. He's baptized, identifying with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And then he receives food, verse 19. And then it says, Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. 
The first thing Paul hears is Brother Saul. Uh, the first touch he feels is Brother Ananias laying hands on him. The first thing he does after he is saved and, and then baptized is he goes to church. Can you imagine that first time Ananias brings him to the disciples there in Damascus? Hey, we got a visitor. Who is it? Saul of Tarsus. Ah! They probably would have wanted to run. Can you imagine being Saul, though? Uh, I, I can't even imagine how amazing, how emotional it must have been. Uh, again, the mixed reactions. He comes in. Saul of Tarsus? Praise the Lord. We've been praying for you to get saved. But others, Saul of Tarsus, he killed my husband. He destroyed my family. He arrested my brother. I mean, just the turmoil in people's lives over Saul of Tarsus coming in with the disciples here. There must have been so many different things going on. I can imagine so many were rejoicing. So many were upset. But then the Lord has to work in their hearts as well. Again, if somebody, if God could save somebody like Saul and turn him into the Apostle Paul, he can save anybody. 1 John 3.14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abides in death. I mean, if you don't love your brothers and sisters who are here in church, why would you want to go to heaven? We're all going to be there. But the old saying is true. You can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. So we're all stuck together. That's a good thing because we have all of eternity to get to know each other and be with Jesus, and it's going to be awesome. But I can imagine when those scales fell off of Paul's eyes, just the weight of his sin and shame just fell out of his heart, out of his mind, and now he sees everything in a whole different light. You know, I don't know about you, but when I first got saved... I mean, it was a pretty radical salvation. Um, I was a very ugly person. And my best friend and I, Rob, you know, did a lot of wild and crazy things together, but we got saved the same night together. So we're spiritual twins. I just talked to him yesterday. And, um, you know, we played baseball together growing up. We surfed for a lot of years growing up. And... He had just turned 21. I was about to turn 21 when we got saved, November 30th, 1977. Do the math. I'm almost 68. Yes. Okay. So, but it's amazing because, you know, now I'm a new creation. Is surfing okay? I don't know if you can surf or not. I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Would Jesus say, it's okay to surf, Jeff? I mean, I struggle with that kind of stuff. I mean, I got, a, I got kicked off the team in baseball at San Diego State. I was given another full-ride scholarship to play baseball at another university, and I actually ended up turning it down because it's like, that was my idol. I can't go back to that. And I ended up going to Bible school. But the cool thing is, you know, Rob, a couple weeks, maybe three weeks after we got saved, he's like, man, the waves are really breaking, Jeff. We have the freedom in Jesus. We can go out there. And I was like tentative. You know, tentative. I still got my boards in my office. And I hadn't seen the water in 40 years, but be that as it may, I'm going down there and I'm like, oh, is this okay? It's kind of nervous. And then we start paddling out together and the waves are awesome. But we could paddle out and I go about 20, 30 yards past the waves, past the break. And I just sat out there on my board. Rob caught a couple waves. I'm just sitting there and I'm just bawling. I just started crying. I'm looking around. A flock of pelicans come skimming by and they're like, God, you created those pelicans. You know, they're just stupid birds before. And, you know, the, sun, the sun's coming up because you get out there at 6 in the morning, starting to come up, and it's like, well, that's your creation. I mean, everything was new. It was fresh. It was alive because before everything was pale and gray in my life. It was like, you know, all of a sudden the living color switch is flipped on and you realize this is all part of God's creation. And I'm yelling at Rob, this is all God. He did this. This is amazing. His creation he goes, oh, I know. And he made these ways for us. Come on. And so, and so we spent, literally we spent the next two hours just surfing and then eventually went to school. I finished out that semester and then the Lord moved me in a different direction. But God wants to do that with all of us. He wants us to, you know, see him in the midst of everything. Realize all things do work together for good to those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So don't ever 
think that he is not for you. He's not against you. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, realize he died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. He rose from the dead, and it's because he's alive he's here. And Jesus is the one who says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and he with me. I'll dine with him and he with me. He wants to come into your life and save you and forgive you and give you a brand new start in life. But you have to come to Christ. You know, you can be convicted. You can see your need. But unless you say yes to Jesus and surrender to him, it's going to all be for naught. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace your mercy, your love, your compassion. We thank you, Lord, for your discipline because we do wander off, but whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he chastens every son who comes to him, and we thank you, Lord. It's because you love us that you correct us. It's because you love us that you want to draw us close to you. And so, Lord, I thank you that you have fulfilled everything concerning the law, and the prophets. And it's only because we are in Christ that the law has been fulfilled in our lives. And we thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much, that you are with us always, even to the end of this age. We thank you, Lord, that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. And so, Lord, give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us from your Word. Every day when we get up or when we're getting ready for bed, whenever you ha we have that opportunity at lunchtime, just to open up your word and let your spirit speak to our hearts, reminding us of how awesome you are and that you have a great plan and purpose for all of our lives. We're not here by accident, Lord, but you brought us together to see you high and lifted up. And like Isaiah May we just be so blown away when you say, Who will I send? Who will go for me? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Give us those ears to hear. And Lord, give us that strength that comes from your Holy Spirit to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. And we just thank you, Jesus, for saving sinners like us and giving us eternal life. We are forever thankful and grateful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. And if you need prayer, please come on down. Uh, don't forget, we'll be praying for Emily for the next six weeks or so. So keep him in prayer as well. so great we can't even fathom how awesome you are but we thank you that you reveal yourself to us as we are able to receive all that you have for us Lord help us to continue to walk on that straight and narrow path may we continue to fight the good fight to keep the faith we want to stay on course Lord until you call us home to be with you and Lord we love you and we thank you and we give you all the praise and honor that you alone deserve. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.